Rupa, and it is a great pleasure for it's a great pleasure for me uh, to have uh, a talk uh, on a virtual platform. And a few days back, uh, Madam Rama Madam, she called me and uh, she invited me for giving a talk. And I took an opportunity. Uh, one small correction: I am retired right now. Uh, last year, I retired from my university job. But still, I'm working as a visiting faculty with the same university, with the same department. So it is a uh, indeed pleasure for me to have all distinguished uh, listeners, distinguished uh, people uh, attending this uh, virtual meeting. Uh, Rama Madam, Ashok Sir, Jayshree Madam, and all other respected faculty members. So I'm very much thankful to all of you for inviting me. Uh, as the madam suggested, that today's uh, my topic is biocrystals in human health and in vitro studies with uh, medicinal plants. On the left hand side is a building of our university, the right hand side where I work for nearly 40 years. Now, biomaterial crystals, uh, the two opposite things are shown over here. Uh, there are two opposite things. Uh, for industrial purpose, we require large crystals good quality and uh, perfection. And uh, for biomaterials, the opposite things are required. Uh, we don't want that crystals to be grown in our body. And we want them, if at all they are grown, they should be in a very small size. So the two opposite things are there. For industry purpose, we require large size, perfections, and large quantities. In our human body, we don't want them to be grown in our body. So there should be uh, no growth of crystals ideally speaking, and if at all they are growing, it must be very small in size. Now, occurrence of uh, biocrystals, uh, there are three broad uh, uh, areas. Uh, one, they are occurring in uh, human, then plants and uh, animals. The crystal growth of uh, specific biomaterial compounds occur in body or living organisms. There are many reasons and various uh, pathogenesis and theories are proposed. So biocrystals encompass various crystals responsible for different ailments, human suffering and health related problems. Now, biomineralization is a very important process taking place in biocrystallization. And the factors which are influencing, they are uh, categorized over here. And uh, the environment is very important then biological, biochemical, and physiochemical. And then again, control mineralization and induced mineralization. So these factors are very important. In other category, the inorganic physicochemical process and where the geological minerals are being deposited in uh, human beings. So these are the broad categories where the biomineralization is taking place. Now, main factors, uh, they are influencing the biocrystals. So main focus of the study of uh, biocrystals, the first is uh, how uh, we study the biocrystals. So the one important part is the growth phenomenon of biocrystals. So how they are growing in body and uh, to study the growth of crystals in human being, it's a very important thing. Another important thing is the parameters affecting the growth of biocrystals. So various uh, parameters are affecting on this growth and it is very important to study because by studying these parameters, we can control their growth. Then morphology of biocrystals, morphology or shape is very important thing. Suppose uh, the crystals are spiky, then when they move in a vessel, they scratch and uh, the bleeding is taking place. But if they are smooth, then uh, no bleeding or comparatively less harm is uh, uh, taking place. Then uh, in vitro studies are very important. We are focusing on that in vitro studies because we are trying to mimic the atmosphere occurring in a human body. Then mechanism of growth and dissolution. Again, it is an area of our interest. First, we have to study the mechanism of growth of uh, biocrystals. And then we have to focus that how they are dissolved. So these two things are very important. And the growth inhibition and dissolution of biocrystals. So growth is taking place and we have to see the 
conditions, under which condition that uh, dissolution is taking place. So dissolution of crystals under various uh, conditions is very important to study. Characterization of uh, biocrystals. Whenever we have any biocrystal growing in our body, whenever it is removed, the characterization is very important. And there are several characterization techniques available, like uh, powder X-ray diffraction technique, then Fourier transform infrared spectroscopic study, then uh, various other spectroscopic study, then thermogravimetry and various type of analysis available to characterize uh, the biocrystals. Uh, the types of uh, biocrystals in a living body, uh, the biocrystals, they have uh, three broad categories. One is organic, another is inorganic and mixture of the both, organic and inorganic both. Then the biocrystals of spatial interest. So we are going to focus only on three different type of biocrystals in today's talk because today's talk is quite elementary one. And uh, it covers the basic things regarding the biocrystals occurring and how to dissolve them or how to inhibit their growth. So we are going to focus on that. And in my next talk, I will go into the much more technical details and our results. So today is a, uh, some sort of an introductory talk. So we are going to focus only on the three main aspects of uh, biocrystals. Uh, one is urethiasis then atheropathies and goldstones and atheromatous plaques. Uh, why to carry out studies on biocrystals? So these elements uh, can be dealt with uh, considering three main aspects. One is the prevention, then relief and cure. All three things can be dealt by our study. And uh, one is uh, uh, growth is of those that reef is something like uh, if the growth is reduced or inhibited then uh, the relief is done and cured then uh, once the crystals are grown by some mechanism they are dissolved completely then cure is taking place so all the three different aspects can be dealt with uh, the present study uh, now we are coming to different type of uh, biomaterial crystals so biomaterial crystals are very beautiful. They look very beautiful, but uh, they are painful and uh, they are not uh, very comfortable for the patients. So biomaterials or biomineral crystals induce several diseases in human body, even in animals also. And protein and vitamins are grown. And this is the photograph of a protein crystal. So protein crystal and virus crystals can be grown. Then urinary stone problem. We have shown the cartoon. Uh, in a top uh, cartoon picture, the healthy kidney, so the face is laughing, and uh, the kidney with a uh, lot of uh, crystals and a lot of stone, so kidney is in a sad face. So urinary stone occurs uh, in a body, which is very painful, and urinary stones are crystalline depositions. Then occurrence of uh, urinary crystals uh, in world. So 12% population of European Union is expected to be suffering from kidney stone problem. And 15% population of North India are again uh, expected to be suffering from urinary stone problem. And there are um, stone bells, uh, particularly in our region, Saurashtra. There are many places where people are suffering from urinary stone problems. So they are known as a stone belts. Uh, these are the chemical constituents of uh, different type of uh, uh, crystals, uh, which are uh, composed of uh, the calcium oxalate monohydrate, the calcium oxalate dihydrate, calcium hydrogen phosphate dihydrate, tricalcium phosphate, magnesium, ammonium, uh, phosphate exhydrate. So these are the uh, crystals, uh, colite and struvite. And we have grown most of this, most of these crystals in our uh, laboratory. So these crystals uh, we have grown in our laboratory. 
these are some humor expected uh, or associated with uh, kidney stone problem. So in a one cartoon uh, with a chisel and hammer, uh, the doctor is trying to remove the kidney stone from the patient. And uh, in other car, uh, uh, the kidney stone itself is giving its experience to small kidney stones. I'm sorry, kids, but last night your father passed, passed him out. Father is not passed away, but passed him out. And another thing is in a Marathi, uh, the person feels that the stone is something like a stone required for kapchi, for paving the road, but it is not there. It is something like a stone uh, from the urinary tract. So Nasik stone and urological center, the common place in this cartoon. So these oxalate crystals are uh, one of the main crystals uh, occurring in urinary stone. And uh, they are also known as a mulberry stone covered with uh, sharp projectiles or projections. And uh, they mask, uh, they, uh, whenever they pass, uh, they, uh, they bleed uh, things and they are very hard and they are radio opaque. So these are the uh, photograph of uh, the uh, uh, calcium oxalate stone as well as uh, how they look in a urine that is shown in the next slide. The phosphate stones are usually called as a calcium phosphate and uh, calcium, magnesium, ammonium phosphate or triple phosphate. And sometimes uh, they look like a dirty white and they are also uh, uh, radio opaque and a calcium phosphate is also known as a brushite and they also appear like a needle under microscope. So uh, the photograph is shown that they look like a needle, needle in a microscope. Then another type of uh, phosphate stones are the struvite stones and they look like a stand bone. Stand bone is something like a deer their horns and the steward stones, they uh, look uh, almost, so it, that is why they are known as a stag horn shape uh, steward stones. So these are uh, looking uh, uh, very completely straight because of their branches, the scratch and uh, the bleeding is taking place. Uh, crystals are mainly responsible for urinary stone problem. There are three broad, uh, broad categories, uh, the calcium oxalate, calcium hydrogen phosphate dihydrate, ammonium magnesium phosphate. And all of these crystals are grown in laboratory using the gel growth method. So we are going to discuss later on uh, about this gel growth method. Another issue uh, for that the crystals are very well, that is arthritis. It is due to the deposition of small crystals in soft tissues of joints. The crystals induce inflammation, particularly when they break. So arthritis is also because of uh, the deposition of crystals. This is some, uh, here is some uh, humor associated with arthritis. Cartoons are shown, particularly with the old people and particularly the athletes have a knee joint problem. And sometimes that they are advised to put chocolate, so lubrication is uh, done very efficiently. The occurrence of uh, arthropathies or arthritis, in India, prevalence of rheumatoid arthritis is 0.75%. In China and Indonesia, it is 0.4%. And arthritis affects 03 to 1% of population all over the world. And uh, in world, in October 12th is celebrated as an Arthritis Day, World Arthritis. Now, crystals mainly responsible for arthritis problem. There are three main sodium butyrate monohydrate. And all these crystals are responsible for uh, the problems uh, related to arthritis. First is gout. 
Gout is due to the deposition of monosodium urate, monohydrate crystals in joints. Gout is also known as king of disease and disease of kings. And gout is, gout is mainly due to the highly nutritious food full of proteins. So in one of the journals of uh, arthritis, the editor made a comment. It is this of kings and kings of disease. Why it is a disease of kings? Because in European countries in old time, people, the kings, they used to eat a lot of red meat and highly nutritious food. And because of the purine metabolism, uh, the deposition of uric acid used to take place and which induced, which used to induce gout. And why it is known as a disease of uh, king of disease? Because it is so much painful. And that is why uh, it is known as a king of disease. So it is a famous quoting that king of diseases and disease of kings. Now, pseudo gout is due to the hydroxy appetite. And uh, the picture shows that we have grown hydroxy appetite, small crystals in form of a ring. And these rings are known as a lysagang rings. And the crystals are grown in the test tube, in a gel medium. So popularly, the formula is CF5PO43OH. And the predominant mineral component of vertebrate bone and tooth animal. So this is a very important biomineral. It is responsible for our bone strength. And whenever we smile, the tooth animal is dis displayed and white teeth is due to the component hydroxy appetite. It is the most stable and most uh, uh, compatible calcium uh, phosphate form. And it is so stable that after the cremation, the asthiful is made up of uh, hydroxy appetite. Pseudo gout, uh, formation of calcium pyrophosphate dihydrate, CPPD, crystals in soft tissues such as cartilage, meniscus, synovial tissue leads to the CPPD deposition disease. The appearance of these crystals in the synovial fluid can give rise to acute arthritic attack with pain and inflammation of joints a condition called as a pseudo gout. So the picture shows uh, the cartoon related to the pseudo gout. And uh, uh, one test tube, uh, we can see that small crystals are the grown in the test tube. These are CPPD crystals. Now, atherosclerosis, uh, when plaque or fatty deposition is taking place, it is called atherosclerosis. These deposits are made up of cholesterol, fatty substances, cellular waste product, and calcium and fabric. So that is responsible for uh, the atherosclerosis. Another biocrystallization is taking place in form of a cataract. Ferritin crystals in cataract, the calcium oxalate crystals are rarely found in lenses of eyes. And the unique structure of ferritin forms a spherical shell in which the iron is stored as Fe3 in a crystalline mineral. So uh, the crystalline structure or the molecular structure is shown and uh, the crystals are responsible for cataract problem also. So the reference uh, uh, by D.G. Brooks, and they have studied the uh, ferritin crystals role in cataract. Then the gold metal stones, uh, these are hard stones and uh, may develop uh, if liver makes more cholesterol, and then the bile can dissolve it. So these are the, uh, uh, particularly the uh, gold metal stones or gold stones. The cholesterol, uh, cholesterol is a term as a Jekyll and Hyde molecule. And we have a famous novel, Mr. Uh, Mr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, usually two different phases are there. One is a very gentleman-like face, another is a, a Satan-like face. So the cholesterol is termed as a Jekyll and Hyde molecule. So it is useful as well as harmful also. A small amount of cholesterol is used by arginal glands to form arginocat Particle hormones by the ovaries to form 
progesterone estrogen and cholesterol and lipid substances control the rate of evaporation from the skin so cholesterol is having a good effect and they are also playing a role in a sex hormone and uh, it is uh, mentioned in the literature that cholesterol is not present the dehydration dehydration would take place very rapidly so it uh, controls the evaporation rate from our skin and uh, there are some as a good cholesterol and cholesterol ldl that delivers cholesterol to our cells and hdl brings it back from the cell and that is why uh, the ldl low density lipoprotein and high density lipoprotein they perform this work and that is why they are termed as a good cholesterol or bad, bad cholesterol the human suffering in 2000 17 million people died due to cardiovascular disease globally in 1986 bypass surgery was 10% of the heart related surgery in india and today it's around 60% and gold stone this is affects 12% people in usa and uh, this is just an introductory part what is cholesterol we all know about the cholesterol cholesterol is one of the most abundant and best known steroids in animal kingdom it was first found in 1770 as a component of goldstone and a french lipid chemist shovel identified it in a animal fat in 1815 and the name is because of the cholesterol is from store sterol steroid alcohol and that is originating the word cholesterol the crystals are also found in plants so i have taken an example this plant is uh, it's a very popular our indoor and the uh, leaves are having a uh, small crystals and uh, well shaped crystals the morphology is well defined and they grow within the leaf now in vitro study now we are focusing on gel growth and these crystals are grown in laboratory by mimicking the atmosphere of human body by gel growth method now here uh, we have shown an example uh, the test to be taken where the gel is set so gel is having a, a, a gel structure it's a porous structure and it is a hydrogel so the water is within the porous structure and you are pouring a supernatant solution on the top of a gel so first you have to mix a, a weak acid with sodium metasilicate and uh, that uh, makes a silic uh, silic uh, silicate uh, polymer and that polymer is having a cross chain like a structure and that forms a gel it's a porous one and in that structure if you are putting a supernatant solution on a set gel then that solution slowly diffuses into the gel and the reaction is taking within the gel material because gel is one one reactant is already there in the gel and another reactant is being diffused from the top and whenever these two reactants they react it with each other the small nucleus takes place and then deposition of uh, nutrients takes place on that nucleus and the crystal grows so the crystal growth is taking place in a gel medium so the photograph shows a test tube where the crystals are grown in a gel they are not put in a gel they are growing in a gel inhibition and dissolution study here the aim is to control or stop the growth of crystals which create human suffering and ideally crystal should be dissolved so here uh, we have to study the dissolution or inhibition of growth ideally the crystals must be dissolved but if it is not possible then their growth is to be inhibited and a very good book is written that advance in crystal growth and inhibition technologies by z amjad and that is a very popular book and uh, is available uh, in a market 
One technique is a growth inhibition and dissolution study. This technique is uh, developed by my one of my student, Dr. Bharat Parekh. Right now, he is in a Pandit Din Dayal uh, Energy University in Gandhinagar. And this technique is very simple technique. It is using a Petri dish and uh, two slides and cover slip. Usually in any pathological lab or any biological lab, these things are available. First thing is that uh, you take a Petri dish and uh, you try to put a small drop of a gel solution. And once uh, the gel solution is just thicken, then you put a uh, cover slip on that. And in a, another slide, you uh, put, a, uh, you put a, another slide on, as a protective layer or as a cover, and then you uh, put uh, another uh, solution in a Petri dish, and that solution uh, just uh, diffuses into the gel and a small crystals are getting developed. And the development of crystal you can see under the microscope. If you have a digital camera facility attached to the microscope, you can record it and you can take photographs. So uh, the method is described over here and uh, the photographs you have taken that is on a brushite crystals and the inhibition we have studied by using a lemon juice or a citric acid or citric acid. So the growth inhibition in vitro is carried out using the citric acid as an inhibiting solution, using a very rapid and simple method, because this is a very rapid method, very simple method. In a gel growth method, it takes almost 15 days crystals to grow. And if you want to study the growth and dissolution, again, uh, it will take a few more days. So within one month, you can have a complete data that how uh, much efficient the growth and dissolution is uh, growth inhibition or growth and dissolution is taking place. But here, the growth of crystal is taking place very rapidly under the microscopic condition. And uh, using the inhibiting solution, whether the inhibition is occurring or not, you can check it uh, very rapidly. Within two, three days, you can have a data with you. So this method is very important. And the paper was published in Karatsnais with uh, Vaidya sir, and uh, it was published in 2007. And the photograph of crystals appeared on the cover page of Current Science. Another is a growth inhibition of calcium oxalate uh, monohydrate crystals. And uh, this is done by a, a very enthusiastic uh, pharmacy uh, faculty member from uh, Pakistan, that is from Karachi. And uh, he has uh, adopted our technique, which uh, I have reported, or I have just discussed in the previous slide. He used that particular technique, and he studied growth inhibition uh, in using the glass slides in a gel-based medium. And uh, he used three different seeds or pulses, and the name of pulses are given. And these pulses uh, he has used to study the growth inhibition of uh, calcium oxalate crystals. And these pulses are very common. Uh, we use in a, our day-to-day -day life. So this technique is used by many people. Then uh, how growth inhibition is occurring? In vitro studies, different herbal extracts of medicinal plants are used in a crystal growth experiments. In gel growth, these extracts are added on the top and the growth rate of the crystals is observed. And aqueous extracts or alcoholic extracts are used. And uh, these theories are uh, discussed uh, by S. Ahmed et al. And, uh, in his uh, paper. So this uh, technique is a uh, very, very efficient technique. Now uh, I'm coming about the reverse pharmacology. That is the favorite subject of uh, Dr. Ashok Bhavedya. So I'm not, I'm not a competent person to describe or discuss about that. But uh, I will just uh, observe a few things about that. If the crystal length decreases, then it is called dissolution, which can be used for the treatment or cure the problem. If the crystal length increase, length increase becomes slow, then it is known as an inhibition. And that can be used for the treatment to give relief. This thing is very important from a reverse pharmacological point of view because Sir has always advocated for 
reverse pharmacology approach. There are large varieties of uh, herbal extracts available. Their toxicity, their potency, they are well documented. If we use those herbal extracts for pilot study in vitro, that can be very much helpful for uh, paving a, a path for in vivo studies or animal studies. And we had uh, one project with Vaidya sir and uh, uh, Mengi madam, and we completed nearly 15 years back. And that project, we worked in a tandem manner. We studied the in vitro, in vitro thing using the gel-based model. And then uh, sir studied the uh, in vivo and animal model things. And uh, we came with a very good uh, results in our DBT major research project. The herbal extracts, we used uh, that uh, herbal extracts of tuberous tragestris and Virginia de Galuta. And uh, these are used for inhibiting calcium oxalate monohydrate crystals. Again, as shown, uh, the photograph is shown about the tribulus terrestris and Virginia Ligaluta. And growth inhibition study was uh, carried out by Dr. Vimal Joshi. Uh, right now, he's a principal at uh, Science College in Petlat, Gujarat. And he has grown uh, the calcium oxalate uh, monohydrate crystals in a test tube. And he used this herbal extracts to study the growth inhibition of these crystals. And the paper was published in Journal of Crystal Growth. And uh, that is to be a very uh, important uh, paper. Growth inhibition of struite crystals. Uh, we used uh, citrus indica lean juice and a significant uh, growth inhibition was observed. And uh, that proves uh, citrus inhibition theory. So citrus inhibition theory in a simple uh, manner, one can say that if uh, in urine, the concentration of citric acid increases, there is a more probability of calcium ion to bind with the citric acid, forming a water soluble calcium citrus salt. But if the uh, uh, amount of uh, oxalic acid is increased in urine, then uh, the probability increases of calcium to bind with uh, oxalic acid or forming a calcium oxalate, which is a water insoluble one. So here, the citric inhibition theory advocates that somehow if we increase the citric acid level in urine, there is a less probability of forming a calcium oxalate salt. And uh, this paper was published by us, uh, Dr. C.K. Chauhan, right now working as a faculty in a government uh, science college, Gandhinagar. And we published this paper in 2008 in urological research. Then uh, growth inhibition of cholesterol crystals. The cholesterol crystal growth inhibition studies was carried out by using Fagonia critica lin. And this uh, herb is uh, grown widely in Sobrast University campus. So with help of bioscience department, we identified the plant. And from that plant, uh, we uh, got the extract using the facility available at bioscience department. And using this uh, extract, we got a very encouraging result for inhibition of cholesterol crystals. The growth of cholesterol crystals is occurring in test tube in form of a needles. And one can see in the test tube, the needles are grown. These are the cholesterol crystals. So the growth inhibition is occurring uh, using the Fagonia criticarlin. And this result uh, was included in the PhD thesis of uh, Dr. Purvesh Vyas. Right now, he's a faculty in Science College in uh, Amreli. Uh, the role of tea uh, uh, in urinary stone. So we uh, always uh, prefer tea in morning and afternoon. And it is a common uh, drink in our country. So tea is having a component which is very much helpful in uh, urinary crystal inhibition study. So the effect of 
uh, minus epicat chin, a component in green tea, is an uh, precipitation and growth of infectious urinary stone and for first precipitations. So this component, epicatechin, is an antioxidant and that is responsible for uh, the amorphous uh, urinary stone inhibition. And uh, this study was carried out by a scientist from Poland, Joltana Priver. And she is working on uh, growth inhibition of various crystals. And uh, she is using a software. Uh, by, uh, by using this particular software, she tries to predict that whether this inhibitor is a potent inhibitor or not. And usually for any chemical reaction, the potential energy should decrease. And that is the law of nature. So if two different ions or different active compounds, they form a complex, then if uh, theoretically the potential energy reduces, then it is a potent uh, uh, inhibitor compound. So like that, uh, she calculates the potential energy by using a software or computer program. And uh, she predicts that particular uh, inhibitor is a potent inhibitor. And that uh, forms a good complex. And by that, uh, she has selected several uh, compounds. And in that, uh, she has uh, taken up the component of a T. And that is used for studying the growth inhibition of urinary stone. Uh, some of our research publications, uh, the uh, one publication is uh, uh, took place in uh, Journal of Crystal Growth in 2005. Uh, the citation is the highest one, 105. And uh, impact factor is 1.830 and of uh, our group uh, with the VADSRS group. And uh, the next uh, publication is, uh, that is, uh, that is uh, uh, in a urological research. And that uh, uh, inhibition and growth of urinary calcium hydrogen phosphate dihydrate using the herbal extracts of uh, tabulus tribulus terrestris and virginia ligaluta and uh, the citations are 76 and the impact factor is 1.45 and that was published in 2005 this is the cover page photograph of the crystals which uh, we uh, we had grown using the uh, glass slides and uh, cover slips using the normal uh, uh, petri dish. And this is a photograph of a bruchite crystal. And that appeared in the on the cover page of Current Science on August 19, 2007. Another research paper, Journal of Material Science, Materials in Medicine, and that was published in 2009. And the citations are 85 and impact factor is 4.55. Uh, this is the round table discussion with uh, Vaidya sir, another Vaidya sir, Vaidya madam, and myself. So this is a round table discussion. And uh, we had a very hectic discussion on that day in Rajkot. This is a picture of our laboratory. Uh, the students uh, working in the lab and uh, just myself uh, looking into the test tube where the crystals are being grown and students are discussing with uh, one visitor. Uh, our acknowledgements are, uh, we are highly thankful to Dr. Vaidya sir and Dr. Rama madam. Uh, we had uh, a very long uh, collaboration with them, uh, almost uh, 25 years. We published uh, high impact factor journal research papers with a citation over 100. And uh, nearly five PhD students completed uh, their doctoral thesis using our collaborative work. And uh, one of my students, Dr. Vimal Joshi, he was the first person to work in this area. And a group of students, uh, Dr. Bharat Parekh, Dr. Chetan Chawan, Dr. Purveshwas, Dr. Kashmir Tank and Dr. Sonal Vasan. So I'm very much thankful to my students 
as well as uh, Vaidya sir and Rama for their, their help and for their and and they use good for uh, good publications. A concluding remark, a crystal growth uh, inhibition study by fruit juices and herbal extracts are very important for preclinical research and important for reverse pharmacology. This is forming important in vitro study. It is used by pharmacists for identifying potential herbal extract. This is multidisciplinary study. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is the photograph before my retirement in university office. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for a very informative talk. It was excellent. Uh, it's a new topic that we could uh, hear today. And it was very interesting. Uh, Ma'am, we could now take up uh, discussion. Uh, so if, you, if anyone has any questions, you can please ask, sir. Mirbai, excellent summary of a many years' work. Oh, it, thank you very much. It appears so simple, but it is difficult to collate so many years' work and so many papers with high citations. And I think that we have left it halfway in terms of human usage. And that's why you rightly emphasized in the last slide that reverse pharmacology with these plants with other things can be done very well. And uh, that's why you remember we had gone to the next door uh, uh, kidney hospital. Yes. I think we had gone there, but it did yes, not yes. work out. But I feel that uh, our youngsters should again, particularly uh, medical youngsters, should particularly yes. explore this further. And I would say that uh, uh, in uh, retirement, you're not retired, but we would <laughs> rather want to have you as adjunct professor. And that is my request yes. to our research director. And uh, you and Ashwin can guide definitely this more. So it comes to light as a product also. But congratulations for a very good lecture. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure, but now it's open for discussion. Uh, I think, uh, if there are any questions, I find that still 19 participants. I'm pretty sure if we request everybody to put down their now uh, video, see their faces, it will be a live discussion, I think. Share, share, uh, share can be stopped. The sharing stops. Then we request uh, both KHSMRC colleagues as well as colleagues from other uh, collaborative institutes. Can we have, uh, if that goes away, the sharing, then we can have their. Uh, sir, if you could uh, stop the screen share. Uh, I've stopped. I've yeah. stopped. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Hiteshi is there. Nirja is there. Dr. Meera is wow. there. <laughs> Sharvari is there. Anybody, please, if you have any question. I have I, some. I saw Dr. Professor Joseph Birbay. Is, yeah. is he still there? I would like him to comment uh, at least uh, first. And then any of your uh, students who are now faculty members, if they are there. Uh, I think uh, I have given uh, them uh, the link and I have put a WhatsApp uh, group message that uh, the talk will be at this particular time. But uh, I think. I think that they may be busy in uh, their duties, particularly to this working day. And uh, people who are working in the colleges, 
they may have some duties so they may not have that is why i suggested uh, uh, shobha here madam to put it in a uh, google drive so whenever they want to uh, watch the lecture they can watch at their own time yeah may i uh, invite uh, dr hitesh dami uh, hitesh can you put on your uh, video also please how much is goldstone related to nafld are patients of nafld also likely to have more goldstones yeah hitesh i see a name here yes ma'am yeah so i would like to ask you a question and then i'll guide it to also the mihir bhai because as one of the things that we talked about when i talked about four mantras from a master one of the things i said was that uh, what are the things that are left which sir has already suggested one thing is for atheroma for sure and that i'm going to discuss later on as dr mehir bhai becomes active after our invitation that is going to go as an adjunct professor so that would be good now the question that i'm asking hiteshi you are patients of nafld more likely to have goldstones they do have cirrhosis and the cancer but also goldstones are more likely to with them it is prevalent in patients with nfld not all of them but yes it is prevalent it is prevalent yeah say mehir bhai yeah. fatty liver is so common these days even with a milder bmi high but the visceral obesity much more and insulin resistance they are the ones who have fatty liver and then the fatty liver it seems so innocuous to many is not so innocuous it could be associated with uh goldstones and late on of course with a uh, uh, cirrhosis and cancer so i think that has picruza kurua been thought of for goldstones dr nutan nabar is i thought she was here has picruza kurua been thought of for goldstones particularly for goldstones anybody from uh, i need it uh, is uh, dr ashish mathi dr nutan was here a little while ago Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am still here. Yeah, tell me, has has picuriza been uh, advocated or being used in our way for uh, goldstones? Yes, yes. Kutki Kutki is recommended. That is picuriza is. Okay. So, Mir Bhai, as you very rightly I ended, would, I would like to add. Yeah. That. picuriza curoa is uh, hydrocholeritic means mere by it increases the water content of the bile and so there is something called cholestatic jaundice and cholestasis and that stasis itself it appears earlier in the biliary capillaries but when larger things happen they accumulate in the gall bladder the stones kind of thing and i feel that one area we had We discussed, but we had not taken step was crystals of oxycholesterol, oxidized cholesterol. Oxidized cholesterol. Okay. Because okay. what what damage is in atheroma as well as everywhere is essentially oxidized uh, LDL, and that oxidized LDL is is the protein which is okay. It's not only the protein crystallization. We have some colleagues now. who are working with us and they are very willing to work on protein crystallization with us and uh, the and i believe i feel that uh, we have to get progressive paper out after it recovers from its practice yes. but uh, all the his thesis is the only not published to my mind all others have almost published and this published yes yeah so what i feel that uh, uh picruza is a very good example rama has taken up and uh, what we need to do is some even in vitro studies about how uh, picrucides 
1 and 2 because Hitesi is done or PAD or picrocyte 2 and picro is the on NAFLD, non alcoholic in fatty liver disease in, in, in vitro work on liver cells. And uh, but we have not studied bile acids because I've been telling for a long time that there are bile acids which are derivatives of cholesterol. And uh, so there is a cholic acid, there is a lithocholic acid. Now, lithocholic acid word itself means litho means stone, as the urolic acids. So the bile acid which leads to stone formation is more called lithocholic acid. And I think some of these things can be done in vitro after a good uh, literature search and what others have done, as well as what is within our capacity. May I request uh, Dr. Shobha Ayer and Dr. Hiteshi, as well as Dr. Nutan, to send all our Picoriza papers to Dr. Mihirbhai Joshi, because I think we have opened up something which we have worked on for so many hepatoprotective plants and uh, our work on uh, Picoriza Kurua dates back, both in vitro vivo and in the clinic, Aroge Vardini and later on. So I think that Hiteshi, if you don't mind, since you will have that, the last uh, um, uh, JIM uh, paper, if you don't mind, just send it to if Shobhaya doesn't have, and then Shobha see that Dr. Okay, Mia Joshi gets that. It's uh, available in internet, but it becomes easier. So, and then we'll take it up that in one of our uh, the discussions on our Tuesday platform to take it further, because this is something which is very good. Dr. Pandey and others, VN Pandey, had shown what you talked about, that it becomes, uh, uh, what, what you call it? Uh, uh, it's hydrocholeric. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. Dr. Meera, anybody else? Sharvali, Dr. Sharvali? Yes, ma'am. Any comment? So it was really an interesting talk. It was a new topic, like very in-depth knowledge. Yeah, for it. you it's new. For us, it is so many years. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I wanted to get it to our platform that uh, yes. one of the things that on Dr. Vaidya's birthday, four mantras, my first mantra was this, where me and I appeared and I have... I send that slide to him also, that whatever we dig and which is covered, let's again uncover and start working on it. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much. Yeah. Shubhada, any comments from you, Shubhada? Sir talked about uh, oxidized LDL. No, I think she's not there. No, uh, but... Ma'am, uh, I have a question for Dr. Joshi. Yes. Uh, uh, question is, uh, uh, is it possible to uh, isolate these five crystals intact in the laboratory from human fluids without disturbing the crystal structure? First thing. Uh, and, uh, 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 people have isolated them. And uh, they've studied uh, extensively. And uh, particularly the urinary crystals, they have done it. Hydroxyapatite, they have done it. And uh, cholesterol, partly they have done it. Because uh, usually uh, they are uh, making a, a complex with the other compounds. So it is uh, slightly difficult. But mineral crystals are very easy to isolate. Very easy to isolate. And the first uh, people isolated them. They took the powder X diffraction study for identification. And uh, they identified them as a particular mineral crystals. And then uh, people started working on the reverse manner, trying to grow the crystals in the laboratory, which factors are affecting the growth and then inhibition and other studies. So that is what we are focusing. And my next question follows this. Uh, your lab made crystals, which you showed in mm. gels, mm. Uh, do they truly mimic the biocrystals? 
yeah uh, uh, in a certain aspect uh, they try to maybe uh, the biocrystals we know that in human being the things are very complex and uh, in a soft tissue uh, the crystals are being grown by supplying the nutrients uh, from our body fluid itself but uh, in a laboratory we have to mimic that situation by an, creating an environment of a soft gel that is something like mimicking the tissue and it is a porous one so that uh, the fluid is being transported being supplied and that nutrient or fluid is having a composition of the different nutrients so that the uh, usually the compounds are being supplied to the site of growth and the crystals grow so it is uh, almost a mimicking not making the exact atmosphere that is why the term is used mimicking it's not uh, exactly the body condition is made so body condition is always very complex but we try to make it in a such a way that we try to understand that how they grow can so, you uh, the name of the person can you show your face and who is asking this question we would love to see you yes ma'am i will do that yeah lovely uh am i visible oh dr meera yes. was asking wow very nice. nice oh madam I, yeah. I thought as much though. <laughs> uh, sir, my uh, next question is uh, this. Since you say uh, you mimic the natural crystals, uh, I just wanted to know because uh, the osmotic conditions that you would be maintaining in your gel would not exactly be uh, the way that it would be in, say, in, within a human system. So when you say you're using it to reverse uh, crystal formation, um, is that going to impact? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good same question. Same. Good, good question, madam. Uh, that was uh, when we uh, started working uh, on this uh, system uh, long back, because it's a uh, big story. Uh, I met uh, Dr. Vaidya nearly 25 years back in one of the conferences in uh, Rajkot. And since uh, uh, we are from the same family, so we know each other. And uh, I asked uh, him at that time casually, are you working on kidney stone? He said, exactly not working on kidney stone, but uh, I worked and uh, I have a, uh, a, a good expertise in kidney stone. Uh, long back, I used to uh, remember that uh, he worked sometimes on kidney stones. Then I told him that uh, my, one of my students is also working on the kidney stone. And then we started collaboration. And that collaboration started with his knowledge of Ayurveda, his knowledge of uh, clinical pharmacology, and our knowledge on uh, physics, as well as characterization and growing crystals. And uh, in the first lot, we did a very simple study, and that work is being published. And that work is published uh, uh, long back, means almost uh, 15 years back. That is very simple work that we use different herbal extracts. But the, your question is very important, that how to mimic the condition. The, in, in kidney, it's a dynamic one. It's not a static one. The union is being continuously generated, flows through the system. So we have to grow the crystals in a dynamic system. Mm -hmm. Another thing is that the, what are the conditions within the urinary tract or kidney? pH level, as you mentioned, osmotic condition. So again, we have to take a help of medicine or pharmacology people and try to create the atmosphere, uh, the dynamic atmosphere. And we try to see that how crystals grow in vitro, not in a system. And we try to use the uh, inhibitors that how they try to inhibit it. Our system right now we study it, it's a static one. But we want to have a uh, dynamic system, as you mentioned, that uh, using different condition, pH level, then osmotic condition, all these factors we have to consider. Again, we try to repeat the thing. It will be much more nearer to the real situation. Not exactly the real situation, but nearer to the real situation. So Doctor, we, uh, may I come in, uh, Mira, madam? Yes, pharmac Reverse pharmacology starts with clinical experiential data or exploratory data or case reports. So the plants we have chosen 
are used for centuries in kidney stone. So when we want to uh, test it and we found it positive, it is already in human positive. Oh, okay. and, and so defining conditions may be different. For example, as Mirvai said, uh, in terms of citric acid, citrate containing fruits, all that. And, uh, but I would like him to say something of your interest. That is how microbes may play a role in crystal formation. Mirvai, please, because she's a microbiologist and uh, she would be very interested there. Uh, accidentally, we found uh, one interesting result, but somehow uh, we could not uh, uh, we could not uh, work on that because of our uh, less expertise. We were growing crystals of uh, uh, potassium tartrate and strontium tartrate in a gel beta, and uh, we found uh, the gel becomes dirty and uh, some cotton-like thing uh, getting attached to the crystals and it stops growth of crystals. Then uh, one fine day, I invited one of my colleague from bioscience department. She is to be a very good friend of mine. So I called her and they said some, something dirty is taking place, some cotton like things, threads or something like that. Because we were not expert in that particular field. She immediately identified these are fungi. Mm -hmm. And these fungi are attaching with the crystals. It stops the growth of crystals. Then she identified the fungi. And we published one paper by doing characterization of that. Later on, one of my students was working on a modern sodium urate monohydrate. And uh, he experienced the same thing. And in a, uh, at one, uh, this uh, monsoon atmosphere, uh, some fungi attack took place and it stopped the growth. But it did not happen again. So it was accidental or whatever maybe. Then we showed the result to Sir and the Sir was very much keen, but it did not take place somehow because it was accidental one. So mm -hmm. we were not expert to identify. And Sir said it is a very important result. These fungi may be uh, working as an inhibitor or maybe having a, some bonding on the crystal, some bonding on the crystalline surface because now the molecular docking is a very important branch of uh, chemistry. In that one, the active site of fungi as well as the uh, crystalline molecule, uh, they are being docked and uh, the potential energy, everything is being counted and they try to do the modeling whether this site binding on the crystal and it will inhibit the growth of crystal or not. So that is a theoretical one and they are using different type of computer software and they predict that this fungi or this uh, uh, particular microorganism will affect uh, positively. Yes, sir. Uh, that actually, the reason that led me to this question was that uh, if you got just like opioids, you can have compounds from fungi which probably can be used as pharmacological substances, which can be consumed if they are if they yes. are not toxic. Yes, you can yes. just consume them, and then probably uh, they may act as inhibitors for you know you need a foci for this crystal to form. If you can yes. just stop the foci from forming itself, then there's no question of crystal formation itself. I mean, so I'm just throwing a wild idea, but uh, I really don't know how much it can be translated. Maybe Madam, you your, can... uh, Madam your idea is uh, absolutely important. And uh, that we discussed with sir, and uh, we found a similar type of result. But unfortunately, it uh, was not observed again. That was an accidental one. Okay. Mira Madam's question has raised some thoughts in my mind that when you have grown crystals, which we could see it in the test tube, and you showed the urine also with oxalate crystals. If you were to separate out those crystals from the test tube, would it have the same morphological features as that you see in the urine? Uh, may not be same because uh, the conditions are different. Even for the kidney stones grown in different patients, yeah. some they are having a, a very uh, rough surface, 
Some are having a stag horn uh, right. type of thing. Some are having a very smooth. So different conditions, pH, uh, temperature, then uh, the nutrients being supplied, all complex things are taking place. And that is why uh, the morphology changes. So, so but, uh, no question on that only. Then how do you characterize and reproducibility for that particular uh, set of experiments? Ah, but uh, we are using the nutrients which are pure material supplied by chemist. Right. That so is we are problem. sure that... Yeah, culture material is there. It's not constant. culture one. Uh, so culture material we are not using. So these are the pure material supplied by chemist, I mean, it's a chemical supplier. And we are using that. So for, for example, uh, calcium oxalate. So we use uh, calcium hydroxide and oxalic acid. So by just reacting calcium hydroxide with uh, oxalic acid, we get uh, calcium oxalate. So it is a pure one. Sir, instead, uh, what if you were to isolate, I mean, you said it's possible to isolate these crystals from urine or from the whatever body fluid. What if, what if you would do the same experiment using patient's crystals? Would yeah, it work? It's a, yeah, it's a very good idea. Uh, but uh, madam, I uh, told you that uh, different pathological conditions, physiological conditions, uh, the crystals obtained in urine, they have a different shape and uh, different particular conditions. So first we should have a, a patient history under which condition these are uh, grown in a uh, urine, urinary tract. And uh, when we recover, then what was the condition of a urine? And uh, on basis of that, we can isolate them. It may not be possible that the crystals isolated from one patient is having a same morphology, same condition from the patient uh, recovered from other patient. So we have to first take the history of the uh, patient as well as from the uh, data collected. And then we try to do that uh, growth inhibition study. Then uh, we can identify whether it is occurring or not. It's a good thing. Thank you, sir. You, Thank you. Usually, Thank madam, you. Uh, uh, the crystals recovered from urine, they are having other components also. For example, uh, uh, uric acid, uh, some proteins associated with our body, and mm. some organic deposition also associated with the crystal. So it's a not pure crystal. And uh, usually people have done the uh, elemental analysis of crystals, and we have a published one paper also by uh, doing the analysis of uh, the kidney stone, not crystal, the kidney stone recovered from a patient. And that gives that it is not a single phase compound. It's not a pure calcium oxalate, but it is having an impurity of other compounds also. And that impurity may play an important role. So uh, hydroxyl appetite, hydroxy appetite, which you were mentioning, is routinely used in many prote protein purification. If, uh, protein yes. chemists routinely use this. Because you can generate hydroxide uh, in a laboratory with a very simple chemical uh, reaction. Absolutely so, right, madam. But uh, uh, what happens is hydroxyl appetite, depending upon the uh, cross-linking, can act like a gel or a sieve also. It has some sieving capacity also. Yes. So... Uh, so it, it, it is used, uh, hydroxyl appetite is used for the targeted drug delivery uh, for separation of uh, DNA yeah. and uh, for, uh, for many uh, uh, biological applications, it is used. And uh, it is a very important biomineral. Right, right. Uh, um, uh, Madam, in fact, uh, I have a one uh, uh, a set of uh, uh, the presentation where I discuss about the growth of hydroxyapatite in the laboratory. And uh, we made a nano composite of hydroxyapatite. And as uh, Shobha Madam uh, mentioned in the introduction, we made a, a composite of hydroxyapatite with curcumin. And uh, we know that curcumin is having antibacterial, antiseptic, and uh, many, many other 
uh, uh, biological uh, uh, activity. So we combine that with the hydroxapatite because hydroxapatite is used as a bone ceramic material. So if you are, you are using hydroxapatite uh, 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 with uh, curcumin, then you are having extra benefit. May I come in? Thank you, sir. I, I think that uh, this problem of microbes, bacteria, fungi, in uh, stones, particularly calcium oxalate, brucite, struite, urolithiasis, there is a paper in uh, 2021. And earlier two years also there are papers. And actually, sometimes it is believed that you need the nidus of a microbe to truly have a reposition around it. And I think this paper, I will uh, request uh, Shobhaya to send to you. And it is in Kidney, a very reputed journal. And uh, it is Kidney, uh, Wal uh, Kidney 2098 to 2000, uh, 200, 298 to 311. 2021, kidney, uh, volume 360, and two. So if, if we get this, or even if you just put a uh, search, search as this, it has also given many references. It's an extensive review and a very good study also. They have also identified the micro, the wonderful photography. I don't know whether you can see this or not. Oh. Yes. Beautiful photographs. So it is it is it is shown that uh, uh, so there is an interest continuing in terms of uh, and if you see here there is a <clears throat> microbe which is actually inside the stone. Yes. And nearby recently, it has been found that microbes are in many tissues. Up till now, we felt that microbes only uh, symbiotic microns exist in lungs and now uh, mouth, mouth, nose, skin, and <laughs> GI tract. But now they are finding in many organs, uh, actually by, by microbacteria, which even sometimes the species identification has not been done also. Same thing applies in this the paper I referred to. So it is very essential to, if we want to review again, what is the current state? Because it is well known that uh, those are really infection, they are more prone to stone formations. So I would say that the plants which we have studied and found very good effect, we have to continue further and we may also take help of Meera Madam for microbiology part of it. Thank you. And the steroid crystals are because of the uh, urea splitting organisms and uh, they are responsible for the uh, certain micro, uh, microbes are responsible for the steroid crystals growth. Great. So, Mirva, it was an excellent talk and you, Thank you very much. generated uh, a lot of discussion too. Uh, I have a, one more talk uh, that is on the much more technical one. Uh, so, we'll, I have, have, not, we'll, have, I, we'll have a second uh, talk uh, in a new uh, time. But uh, in next month, we'll try to give. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because that will be much more technical. I have not given any data right now. This was an introductory one. Yeah. So uh, I have not given any data in this particular talk. And uh, I have one talk about the nano hydroxyapatite and its applications. So uh, Madam suggested that nano hydroxyapatite is very important one for many biological applications. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, Thank you very much. Yes, Thank you. Yeah, very nice. Lovely. And uh, since it will be recorded and it will be available. Yes. Uh, right, right.
send your congrats to Dr. Mihirbhai, of course. And then I don't know where we, Rhoda will know about it. Are we putting in our website or we are putting it, uh, where, where do we? No, actually, it's a very huge file. So I will be sending it to everyone personally, ma'am, so that everyone can have an access to it. Since it's a huge file, we will not be able to upload it on the website. So, so sure. Shobha, we can upload it. We have a YouTube site also. YouTube site. So we yeah. can upload it there and we can send the yeah, link. Yeah, we should sir. keep from YouTube. We yes. send the link to sir. Yes, that will be. Uh, yes. I will send the original link also. Also, this YouTube, uh, once we upload it, we can send it to you, sir. That you can be. have a two version. If you want to uh, upload only talk, and talk plus discussion, whatever is possible, then you can edit it and you can upload it on YouTube channel. So yes. that will be giving a viewership uh, on a larger uh, scale and yes. people can have a uh, view of that. Sure. Thanks. Thank you very much. Siddesh is there? Yes, ma'am. Do I will do this with Siddesh maybe tomorrow or something. Yeah. Sure. Okay. sure. Thanks, Mirbai. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rama Ben. Thank Shama, you. Thanks and thanks, thank everybody. Pranam Ashok Bhai. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So I leave the meeting. Okay. Thank you.